Part 3, Chapter 2, Section 2 of No More Parades. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Peter Dan. Part 3, Chapter 2, Section 2. The General said, What was I saying? I am dreadfully tired. No one could stand this. He drew from inside his tunic a lapis lazuli coloured, small, be coroneted note case, and selected from it a folded paper that he first looked at and then slipped between his belt and his tunic. He said, On top of all the responsibility I have to bear, he asked, Has it occurred to you that if I am of any service to the country, your taking up my energy, sapping my energy over your affairs, is aiding your country's enemies? I can only afford four hours sleep as it is. I've got some questions to ask you. He referred to the slip of paper from his belt, folded it again, and again slipped it into his belt. Teachin's mind missed a notch again. It was the fear of the mud that was going to obsess him. Yes, curiously, he had never been under heavy fire in mud. You would think that that would not have obsessed him, but in his ear he had just heard uttered in a whisper of intense weariness the words, Es ist nicht so es tragen, es ist das das uns verloren hat. Words in German of utter despair, meaning, it is unbearable, it is that that has ruined us, the mud. He had heard those words standing amidst volcanic craters of mud, amongst ravines, monstrosities of slime, cliffs and distances, all of slime. He had been going, for curiosity or instruction, from Verdun, where he had been attached to the French, on a holiday afternoon when nothing was doing, with a guide to visit one of the outlying forts. Daumont? No. Daumont. Taken from the enemy about a week before. When would that be? He had lost all sense of chronology. In November. A beginning of some November with a miracle of sunshine, not a cloud, the mud towering up shut you in intimately with a sky that ached for limpidity, and the slime had moved, following a French bombardier who was strolling along, eating nuts disreputably, his shoulders rolling. Deserteurs, the moving slime, was German deserters. You could not see them, the leader of them, an officer, had his glasses so thick with mud that you could not see the colour of his eyes, and his half-dozen decorations were like the beginnings of swallows' nests, his beard like stalactites. Of the other men you could only see the eyes, extraordinarily vivid, mostly blue like the sky. Deserters, led by an officer of the Hamburg Regiment, as if an officer of the Buffs had gone over. It was incredible. And that was what the officer had said as he passed, not shamefacedly, but without any humanity left in him. Done. Those moving saurians compacted of slime kept on passing him afterwards all the afternoon, and he could not help picturing their immediate antecedents for two months in advanced pillboxes. No, they didn't have pillboxes then. In advanced pockets of mud, in dreadful solitude amongst those ravines, suspended in eternity at the last day of the world. And it had horribly shocked him to hear again the German language, a rather soft voice, a little suety, like an obscene whisper, the voice obviously of the damned. Hell could hold nothing curious for those poor beasts. His French guide had said sardonically, On dirait l'enferno de Dante. Well, those Germans were getting back on him. They were now to become an obsession, a complex, they said nowadays. The general said coolly, I presume you refuse to answer. That shook him cruelly. He said desperately, I had to end what I took to be an unbearable position for both parties, in the interests of my son. Why in the world had he said that? He was going to be sick. It came back to him that the general had been talking of his separation from Sylvia. Last night that had happened. He said, I may have been right, I may have been wrong. The general said icily, If you don't choose to go into it, Tietjen said, I would prefer not to. The general said, There is no end to this, but there are questions it's my duty to ask. If you do not wish to go into your marital relations, I cannot force you. But damn it, are you sane? Are you responsible? Do you intend to get Miss Wanup to live with you before the war is over? Is she perhaps here in the town, now? Is that your reason for separating from Sylvia? Now, of all times in the world? Teachin said, No, sir. I ask you to believe that I have absolutely no relations with that young lady. None. I have no intention of having any. 
None, the general said. I believe that. Circumstances last night, Teachin said, convinced me suddenly there on the spot that I had been wronging my wife. I had been putting a strain on the lady that was unwarrantable. It humiliates me to have to say it. I had taken a certain course for the sake of the future of our child, but it was an atrociously wrong course. We ought to have separated years ago. It has led to the ladies pulling the strings of all these shower baths. The general said, Pulling the... Teachin said, It expresses it, sir. Last night was nothing but pulling the string of a shower bath. Perfectly justifiable. I maintain that it was perfectly justifiable. The general said, Then why have you given her groby? You're not a little soft, are you? You don't imagine you've, say, got a mission, or that you're another person, that you have to... to forgive? He took off his pretty hat and wiped his forehead with a tiny cambric handkerchief. He said, Your poor mother was a little... He said suddenly, Tonight, when you're coming to my dinner, I hope you'll be decent. Why do you so neglect your personal appearance? Your tunic is a disgusting spectacle. Teachin said, I had a better tunic, sir, but it has been ruined by the blood of the man who was killed here last night. The general said, You don't say you have only two tunics. Have you no mess clothes? Teachin said, Yes, sir, I have my blue things. I shall be all right for tonight. But almost everything else I possessed was stolen from my kit when I was in hospital. Even Sylvia's two pairs of sheets. But hang it all, the general exclaimed. You don't mean to say you've spaffled all your father left you? Teachin said, I thought fit to refuse what my father left me, owing to the way it was left. The general said, But good God! Read that. He tossed the small sheet of paper at which he had been looking across the table. It fell face downwards. Teachin's read in the minute handwriting of the generals. Colonel's horse, sheets, Jesus Christ, one-up girl, socialism? The general said irritably, The other side, the other side. The other side of the paper displayed the words in large capitals, Workers of the World, a woodcut of a sickle and some other objects, then high treason for a page. The general said, Have you seen anything like that before? Do you know what it is? Teachins answered, Yes, sir, I sent that to you, to your intelligence. The general thumped both his fists violently on the army blanket. You, he said, it's incomprehensible, it's incredible. Teachin said, No, sir, you sent out an order asking commanders of units to ascertain what attempts were being made by socialists to undermine the discipline of their other ranks. I naturally asked my sergeant major, and he produced this sheet, which one of the men had given to him as a curiosity. It had been handed to the man in the street in London. You can see my initials on the top of the sheet. The general said, You... you'll excuse me, but you're not a socialist yourself. Teachin said, I knew you were working around to that, sir, but I've no politics that did not disappear in the 18th century. You, sir, prefer the 17th. Another shower bath, I suppose, the general said. Of course, Teachin said, if it's Sylvia that called me a socialist, it's not astonishing. I'm a Tory of such an extinct type that she might take me for anything. The last megatherium. She's absolutely to be excused. The general was not listening. He said, What was wrong with the way your father left his money to you? My father, Teachin said, the general saw his jaw stiffen, committed suicide because a fellow called Ruggles told him that I was what the French call macaro. I can't think of the English word. My father's suicide was not an act that can be condoned. A gentleman does not commit suicide when he has descendants. It might influence my boy's life very disastrously. The general said, I can't... I can't get to the bottom of all this. What in the world did Ruggles want to go and tell your father that for? What are you going to do for a living after the war? They won't take you back into your office, will they? Teachin said, No, sir. The department will not take me back. Everyone who has served in this war will be a marked man for a long time after it is over. That's proper enough. We're having our fun now. The general said, You say the wildest things. Teachin's answered, You generally find the things I say come true, sir. Could we get this over? Ruggles told my father what he did because it is not a good thing to belong to the 17th or 18th centuries in the 20th. Or really because it is not good to have taken one's public school's ethical system seriously. I am, really, sir, the English public schoolboy. 
That's an 18th century product. What with the love of God that God help me, they rammed into me at Clifton, and the belief Arnold forced upon Rugby that the vilest of sins, the vilest of all sins, is to peach to the headmaster. That's me, sir. Other men get over their schooling. I never have. I remain adolescent. These things are obsessions with me. Complexes, sir. The general said, All this seems to be very wild. What's this about peaching to the headmaster? Teachin said, For a swan song, it's not wild, sir. You're asking for a swan song. I am to go up into the line so that the morals of the troops in your command may not be contaminated by the contemplation of my marital infelicities. The general said, You don't want to go back to England, do you? Teachin's exclaimed, Certainly not. Very certainly not. I can never go home. I have to go underground somewhere. If I went back to England, there would be nothing for me but going underground by suicide. The general said, You see all that? I can give you testimonials. Teachin's asked, Who couldn't see that it's impossible? The general said, But suicide, you won't do that. As you said, think of your son. Teachin said, No, sir, I shan't do that. But you see how bad for one's descendant suicide is. That is why I do not forgive my father. Before he did it, I should never have contemplated the idea. Now I have contemplated it. That's a weakening of the moral fibre. It's contemplating a fallacy as a possibility. For suicide is no remedy for a twisted situation of a psychological kind. It is for bankruptcy or for military disaster. For the man of action, not for the thinker. Creditors' meetings wipe the one out. Military operations sweep on. But my problem will remain the same whether I'm here or not for it's insoluble. It's the whole problem of the relations of the sexes. The general said, Good God! Titchin said, No, sir, I've not gone off my chump. That's my problem. But I'm a fool to talk so much. It's because I don't know what to say. The general sat staring at the tablecloth. His face was suffused with blood. He had the appearance of a man in monstrous ill humour. He said, You had better say what you want to say. What the devil do you mean? What's this all about? Teachin said, I'm enormously sorry, sir. It's difficult to make myself plain. The general said, Neither of us do. What is language for? What the hell is language for? We go round and round. I suppose I'm an old fool who cannot understand your modern ways. But you're not modern. I'll do you that justice. That beastly little McKechnie is modern. I shall ram him into your divisional transport job so that he won't incommode you in your battalion. Do you understand what the little beast did? He got leave to go and get a divorce, and then did not get a divorce. That's modernism. He said he had scruples. I understand that he and his wife and some dirty other fellows slept three in a bed. That's modern scruples. Teachin said, no, sir, it's not really. But what is a man to do if his wife is unfaithful to him? The general said as if it were an insult, divorce the harlot or live with her. Only a beast, he went on, would expect a woman to live all her life alone in a cockloft. She's bound to die or go on the streets. What sort of a fellow wouldn't see that? Was there any sort of beast who'd expect a woman to live with a man beside her? Why, she'd, she'd be bound to. He'd have to take the consequences of whatever happened. The general repeated, whatever happened, if she pulled all the strings of all the shower baths in the world. Teachin said, still, sir, there are, there used to be, in families of position, a certain... He stopped. The general said, Well? Teachin said, On the part of the man, a certain, call it, parade. The general said, Then there had better be no more parades. He said, Damn it, besides us, all women are saints. Think of what childbearing is. I know the world. Who would stand that? You? I'd, I'd rather be the last poor devil in Perry's lines. He looked at Teachin's with a sort of injurious cunning. Why don't you divorce? he asked. Panic came over Teachin's. He knew it would be his last panic of that interview. No brain could stand more. Fragments of scenes of fighting, voices, names, went before his eyes and ears. Elaborate problems. The whole map of the embattled world ran out in front of him, as large as a field. An embossed map in greenish paper mache, a ten acre field of embossed paper mache, with the blood of O'Nine Morgan blurring luminously over it. Years before, how many months? 
19 to be exact, he had sat on some tobacco plants on the Mont de Carte, no, the Montagne Noire, in Belgium. What had he been doing? Trying to get the lie of the land? No. Waiting to point out positions to some fat home general who had never come. The Belgian proprietor of the tobacco plants had arrived and had screamed his head off over the damaged plants. But up there you saw the whole war, infinite miles away, over the sullied land that the enemy forces held, into Germany proper. Presumably you could breathe in Germany proper. Over your right shoulder you could see a stump of a tooth, the cloth hall at Ypres, at an angle of fifty degrees below, dark lines behind it, the German trenches before Vicieta. That was before the great mines had blown Vicieta to hell. But every half minute, by his wristwatch, White puffs of cotton wool existed on the dark lines, the German trenches before Vicieta, our artillery practice. Good shooting, jolly good shooting. Miles and miles away to the left, beneath the haze of light that, on a clouded day, the sea threw off, a shaft of sunlight fell and was reflected in a grey-blue. It was the glass roofs of a great airplane shelter. A great plane, the largest he had ever seen, was moving over behind his back, with four little planes as an escort, over the vast slag heaps by Bethune, high purplish-blue heaps like the steam domes of engines or the breasts of women, bluish-purple, more blue than purple, like all Franco-Belgian goblin tapestry, and all quiet under the vast pall of quiet cloud. There were shells dropping in Popperingay, five miles out under his nose. The shells dropped, white vapour rose and ran away in plumes. What sort of shells? There were twenty different kinds of shells. The Huns were shelling Popperingay, a senseless cruelty. It was five miles behind the lines, Prussian brutality. There were two girls who kept a tea shop in Popperingay, high-coloured. General Plumer had liked them, a fine old general. The shells had killed them both. Any man might have slept with either of them with pleasure and profit. Six thousand of His Majesty's officers must have thought the same about those high-coloured girls. Good girls. But the Hun shells got them. What sort of fate was that? To be desired by six thousand men and smashed into little gobbets of flesh by Hun shells. It appeared to be mere Prussianism, the senseless cruelty of the Huns, to shell Popperingay. An innocent town with a tea shop, five miles behind Ypres, little noiseless plumes of smoke rising under the quiet blanketing of the pale maroon skies, with the haze from the aeroplane shelters and the great aeroplanes over the Bethune slag heaps. What a dreadful name, Bethune. Probably, however, the Germans had heard that we were massing men in Popperingo. It was reasonable to shell a town where men were being assembled, or we might have been shelling one of their towns with an army HQ in it, so they shelled Popperingay in the silent grey day. That was according to the rules of the service. General Campion, accepting with equanimity what German airplanes did to the hospitals, camps, stables, brothels, theatres, boulevards, chocolate stalls and hotels of his town, would have been vastly outraged if Hun planes had dropped bombs on his private lodgings. The rules of war! You spare mutually each other's headquarters and blow to pieces girls that are desired by six thousand men apiece. That had been nineteen months before. Now, having lost so much emotion, he saw the embattled world as a map, an embossed map of greenish paper mache. The blood of O'Nine Morgan was blurring luminously over it. At the extreme horizon was territory labelled White Ruthenians. Who the devil were those poor wretches? He exclaimed to himself, By heavens, is this epilepsy? He prayed, Blessed saints, get me spared that. He exclaimed, No, it isn't. I've complete control of my mind, my uppermost mind. He said to the general, I can't divorce, sir. I've no grounds. The general said, Don't lie. You know what Thurston knows. Do you mean that you have been guilty of contributory misconduct, whatever it is, and can't divorce? I don't believe it. Titchin said to himself, Why the devil am I so anxious to shield the whore? It's not reasonable. It's an obsession. White Ruthenians are miserable people to the south of Lithuania. You don't know whether they incline to the Germans or to the Poles. The Germans don't even know. The Germans were beginning to take their people out of the line where we were weak. They were going to give them proper infantry training. 
that gave him teachings a chance. They would not come over strong for at least two months. It meant, though, a great offensive in the spring. Those fellows had sense. In the poor beastly trenches the Tommies knew nothing but how to chuck bombs. Both sides did that, but the Germans were going to cure it. Stood chucking bombs at each other from forty yards. The rifle was obsolete. Ha <laughs> ha! Obsolete! The civilian psychology. The general said, No, I don't believe it. I knew you did not keep any girl in any tobacco shop. I remember every word you said at Rye in 1912. I wasn't sure then. I am now. You tried to let me think it. You had shut up your house because of your wife's misbehaviour. You let me believe you had been sold up. You weren't sold up at all. Why should it be the civilian psychology to chuckle with delight uproariously when the imbecile idea was promulgated that the rifle was obsolete? Why should public opinion force on the war office a training camp course that completely cut out any thorough instruction in the rifle and communication drill? It was queer. It was, of course, disastrous. Queer, not altogether mean. Pathetic, too. Love of truth, the general said. Doesn't that include a hatred for white lies? No, I suppose it doesn't, or your servants could not say you were not at home. Pathetic, Teachin said to himself. Naturally, the civilian population wanted soldiers to be made to look like fools and to be done in. They wanted the war won by men who would at the end be either humiliated or dead, or both. Except, naturally, their own cousins or fiancés, relatives. That was what it came to. That was what it meant when important gentlemen said that they had rather the war were lost than that the cavalry should gain any distinction in it. But it was partly the simple, pathetic illusion of the day that great things could only be done by new inventions. You extinguished the horse, invented something very simple, and became God. That is the real pathetic fallacy. You fill a flower pot with gunpowder and chuck it in the other fellow's face, and hey presto, the war is won, all the soldiers fall down dead, and you, you who forced the idea on the reluctant military, are the man that won the war. You deserve all the women in the world, and... You get them, once the cavalry are out of the way. The general was using the words, Headmaster. It brought Teachens completely back. He said collectively, Really, sir, why this strafe of yours is so terribly long is that it embraces the whole of life. The general said, You're not going to drag a red herring across the trail. I say you regarded me as a headmaster in 1912. Now I am your commanding officer, which is the same thing. You must not peach to me. That's what you call the Arnold of Rugby touch. But who was it said, Magna est veritest et prev... Prev something? Teachin said, I don't remember, sir. The general said, What was the secret grief your mother had in 1912? She died of it. She wrote to me just before her death and said she had great troubles and begged me to look after you, very specially. Why did she do that? He paused and meditated. He asked, How do you define Anglican sainthood? The other fellows have canonizations, all ship shape like Sandhurst examinations. But us Anglicans, I've heard fifty persons say your mother was a saint. She was. But why? Teachin said, It's the quality of harmony, sir. The quality of being in harmony with your own soul. God having given you your own soul, you are then in harmony with heaven. The general said, ah, that's beyond me. I suppose you will refuse any money I leave you in my will? Teachin said, why no, sir? The general said, but you refused your father's money because he believed things against you. What's the difference? Teachin said, one's friends ought to believe that one is a gentleman, automatically. That is what makes one and them in harmony. Probably your friends are your friends because they look at situations automatically as you look at them. Mr. Ruggles knew that I was hard up. He envisaged the situation. If I were hard up, what would he do? Make a living out of the immoral earnings of women. That, translated into the government circles in which he lives, means selling your wife or mistress. Naturally, he believes that I was the sort of fellow to sell my wife. So that's what he told my father. The point is, my father should not have believed him. But I, the general said, Teachin said, you never believed anything against me, sir. The general said, I know I've damn well worried myself to death over you. Teachens was sentimental at rest, still with wet eyes. He was walking near Salisbury in a grove, regarding long pastures and ploughlands running to dark high elms, 
from which embowered, embowered was the word, peeped the spire of George Herbert's church. One ought to be a 17th century parson at the time of the Renaissance of Anglican saintliness, who wrote perhaps poems. No, not poems, prose, the statelier vehicle. That was homesickness. He himself was never to go home. The general said, Look here, your father... I'm concerned about your father. Didn't Sylvia perhaps tell him some of the things that distressed him? Deachin said distinctly, No, sir, that responsibility cannot be put on to Sylvia. My father chose to believe things that were said against me by a perfect, or a nearly perfect, stranger. He added, As a matter of fact, Sylvia and my father were not on any sort of terms. I don't believe they exchanged two words for the last five years of my father's life. The general's eyes were fixed with an extreme hardness on Teachin's. He watched Teachin's face, beginning with the edges round the nostrils, go chalk white. He said, he knows he's given his wife away. Good God! With his face colourless, Teachin's eyes of porcelain blue stuck out extraordinarily. The general thought, what an ugly fellow! His face is all crooked. They remained looking at each other. In the silence, the voices of men talking over the game of house came as a murmur to them. A rudimentary card game monstrously in favour of the dealer. When you heard voices going on like that, you knew they were playing house, so they had had their dinners. The general said, It isn't Sunday, is it? Teachin said, No, sir, Thursday, the 17th, I think, of January. The general said, Stupid of me. The men's voices had reminded him of church bells on a Sunday and of his youth. He was sitting beside Mrs. Teachin's hammock under the great cedar at the corner of the stone house at Groby. The wind being from the east-northeast, the bells of Middlesbrough came to them faintly. Mrs. Teachin's was thirty, he himself thirty, Teachin's, the father, thirty-five or so. A most powerful, quiet man, a wonderful landowner, like his predecessor for generations. It was not from him that this fellow got his... his his what? Was it mysticism? Another word. He himself, home on leave from India, his head full of polo, talking for hours about points in ponies with Teachin's father, who was a wonderful hand with a horse. But this fellow was much more wonderful. Well, he got that from the sire, not the dam. He and Teachin's continued to look at each other. It was as if they were hypnotised. The men's voices went on in a mournful cadence. The general supposed that he too must be pale. He said to himself, This fellow's mother died of a broken heart in 1912. The father committed suicide five years after. He had not spoken to the son's wife for four or five years. That takes us back to 1912. Then, when I strafed him in Rye, the wife was in France with Perone. He looked down at the blanket on the table. He intended again to look up at Teachin's eyes with ostentatious care. That was his technique with men. He was a successful general because he knew men. He knew that all men will go to hell over three things, alcohol, money, and sex. This fellow apparently hadn't. Better for him if he had. He thought, it's all gone. Mother, father, Groby, this fellow's down and out. It's a bit thick. He thought, but he's right to do as he's doing. He prepared to look at Teachin's. He stretched out a sudden, ineffectual hand. Sitting on his beef case, his hands on his knees, Teachin's had lurched. A sudden lurch, as an old house lurches when it is hit by an H.E. shell. It stopped at that. Then he righted himself. He continued to stare direct at the general. The general looked carefully back. He said, very carefully too, In case I decide to contest West Cleveland, it is your wish that I should make Groby my headquarters? Teachin said, I beg you, sir, that you will. It was as if they both heaved an enormous sigh of relief, the general said. But I need not keep you. Teachin stood on his feet, wanly, but with his heels together. The general also rose, settling his belt. He said, You can fall out. Teachin said, My cookhouses, sir, Sergeant Cook Case, will be very disappointed. He told me that you couldn't find anything wrong if I gave him ten minutes to prepare. The general said, Case? Case? Case was in the drums when we were at Delhi. He ought to be at least quartermaster by now. 
but he had a woman he called his sister. Ditchin said, he still sends money to his sister. The general said, he went absent over her when he was colour sergeant and was reduced to the ranks twenty years ago, that must be. Yes, I'll see your dinners. In the cookhouses, brilliantly accompanied by Colonel Levin, the cookhouse spotless with limed walls and mirrors that were the tops of camp cookers, the general, teachings at his side, walked between goggle-eyed men in white who stood to attention, holding ladles. Their eyes bulged, but the corners of their lips curved because they liked the general and his beautifully unconcerned companions. The cookhouse was like a cathedral nave, aisles being divided off by the pipes of stoves. The floor was of coke breeze, shining under French polish and turpentine. The building paused as when a godhead descends. In breathless focusing of eyes, the godhead, frail and shining, walked with short steps up to a high priest who had a walrus moustache and, with seven medals on his Sunday tunic, gazed away into eternity. The general tapped the sergeant's good conduct ribbon with the heel of his crop. All stretched ears heard him say, How's your sister, Case? Gazing away, the sergeant said, I'm thinking of making her Mrs. Case. Slightly leaving him in the direction of high, varnished pitch-pine panels, the general said, I'll recommend you for a quartermaster's commission any day you wish. Do you remember Sir Garnet inspecting field kitchens at Ketter? All the white, tubular beings with global eyes resembled the pierrots of a child's Christmas nightmare. The general said, Stand at ease, men, stand easy. They moved as white objects move in a childish dream. It was all childish. Their eyes rolled. Sergeant Case gazed away into infinite distance. My sister would not like it, sir, he said. I'm better off as a first-class warrant officer. With his light step, the shining general went swiftly to the varnished panels in the eastern aisle of the cathedral. The white figure beside them became instantly tubular, motionless and globalized. On the panels were painted tea, sugar, salt, curry powder, flour, pepper. The general tapped with the heel of his crop on the locker panel labelled pepper, the top right-hand locker panel. He said to the tubular, globalized white figure beside it, Open that, will you, my man? To Teachens, this was like the sudden bursting out of the regimental quickstep, as after a funeral with military honours, the band and drums march away, back to barracks. End of Part 3, Chapter 2, Section 2 End of No More Parades by Ford Maddox Ford